discharges. <laughs> um, but before I get started, I wanted to tell you a couple things. One, I wanted to let you know if you're really in on this buyer retention maintenance stuff, we're going to have a webcast tomorrow from 12 to 1.30. It's free. Registration is required. You signed up? Yeah. Awesome. Great. So the registration automatically closes like today at noon. But if you just email me, I'll put you on the list. It's not a big deal. So um, that said, we also did a webcast on what I'm presenting to you today. We did two of them. We did one in January. And after we do a webcast, we archive it, we put it on the website so you can listen to it whenever. You know, sometimes you can't make it 12 o'clock on a Thursday. It's time. We get that. So they're there free whenever you want to listen to them. I did one in, we did one in January on the crediting for illicit discharges, and then we did one in February on what I'm also going to show you. It's kind of like discharge discovery techniques, so they're there. Um, and I just wanted to say that um, I really wish I brought the report with me, but again, this was an expert panel report. It's like 75 pages long. We have yet to make it into a fact sheet because it was recently approved, but it's on the list of things to do. So in the next couple months, we'll create a fact sheet for this. So stay tuned. Um, but yeah, that's that. So this is my little joke, 50, grades of, it's 50 shades of gray infrastructure. The panel started off being the illicit discharge detection and elimination panel, but the panelists felt that there were various pathways that, um, you know, pollutants got into the storm drain system that could qualify. So the change, the name of the panel is literally, or changed to nutrient discharges for gray <coughs> infrastructure to kind of reflect those various pathways. Um, so today we're just going to talk a little bit about how you can get credit for your IDDE program, which is required, you know, you have to have this program under your MS4 process. So this is going to be how you can get credit towards TDL reductions. Um, then we'll talk about what the future credit is going to hold. So in a couple of years, they're, they're, they're transitioning from a programmatic credit to individual discharge credit. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then I've got a couple techniques based on that webcast. So again, if I don't get into enough detail, I would encourage you to, um, you know, watch the webcast or listen to the webcast while you're doing other stuff. Um, and it'll talk about <clears throat> how you can focus the search for illicit discharges, and how you find them, how you track them upstream to their source, because that's, you know, you might find one, but where's it really coming from? And then, um, actually not that last one. <laughs> so again, this is the final report for getting credit for finding and fixing illicit discharges in your watershed. Um, it was approved in last November, which meant it went through all these various work groups and then it becomes an official, creditable urban BMP that can be used in your restoration techniques. Um, some of the things that the panel and the report outline is that um, an ND is short for nutrient discharges. So it's the same thing as an implicit discharge, basically. Um, so just use those interchangeably. The, there's conclusive evidence that nutrient discharges increase the nitrogen and phosphorus levels in dry weather urban stream flow. That the dry weather nutrient discharges can account from anywhere between 20 and 40 percent of the annual nutrient load in an urban watershed, really depending on the age and condition of the infrastructure. And that also nutrient discharges can comprise anywhere between one and two percent of the total urban wet weather load particularly during intense or extreme storms. That said, the panel did not move forward with a wet weather credit, um, just because there ended up being major legal complications. So what the panel ultimately recommended was kind of a two-tiered approach. One, which is a credit that is available now, is a credit for your IDDE program with a few tweaks. So it's not the existing IDDE program as outlined by the permit. It's an enhanced IDDE program. In two years, there will be credits available for finding individual, finding and fixing individual discharges. And I'll talk you through that, so that makes a little more sense. Um, at any point, because it's kind of new stuff, so at any point, if it doesn't make sense, please just interrupt me and you know, ask a question. Um, so the program credit that's available right now is that you can get a credit equivalent to a maximum of 1% of the dry weather nutrient load within the jurisdiction which in turn is defined as 20% of the total annual nitrogen and phosphorus load discharged from the urban pervious land where the advanced nutrient um, reduction program is being targeted. That sounds very confusing, so we're going <laughs> to fix that in a minute and show you exactly what I mean. The, basically, the walk away is with an advanced program, you can get a credit for 0.2% in your annual nutrient load 
from the urban pervious land that's being targeted by the advanced program. I'm going to take you step by through, uh, step by step through a design example, so it'll hopefully be a little bit more clear. It's not a very big credit because the whole approach was we will get people. We've got regular compliance of an IDDE program. Now we want to get people to do like an advanced program where we're going a little bit above and beyond the minimum requirements. And then we're going to get people to collect individual discharge data, which is a little bit more. So it's kind of this step-by-step -step approach to get people to where localities where they need to be in collecting data. <coughs> so the advanced program is not just what's required under your basic IDDE program. There are a few extra steps that need, you need to take. So there are several qualifying criteria for this program. Um, the locality needs to provide justification that they are operating at an advanced level. And so at a minimum, they need to document the methods that they use to analyze dry weather stream monitoring data in order to prioritize the catchments where they'll be doing these programs. Um, so those are kind of the highest risk areas for nutrient and bacteria. They need to document the number of outfalls in those priority, priority catchments that they are um, investigating through, um, so they, they, the, the number of outfalls that are being investigated, we, the panel recommended the outfall reconnaissance in inventory, which is part of the IDE manual that the Center for Watershed Protection put together in 2005. If you have your own local uh, outfall investigation form, that's fine too. It's just to make sure that you're looking at the same things. Um, so here's an example of the ORI that's in the IDDE manual that I was just telling you about. The things you're looking for when you get to an outfall, is there odor present, is there color? It's all, this is very much based on visual inspection. Again, if you have your own form that you use when you're investigating outfalls, then that's fine too. <coughs> okay. So the other thing that needs to be reported in order to get this advanced credit is the number of the outfalls that were subjected to nutrient testing. So this is where you're getting a little bit, you know, so you're doing your outfall, you're doing visual inspections as part of your regular IDDE program, but you're not necessarily doing and in order to get this advanced credit, you're going to have to do nutrient testing. Um, you can use the flowchart method, which I'm going to go over in a couple of minutes, or some other equivalent measure. But another important thing is that this testing is looking at outfalls of all diameters. We know that in a lot of the um, MS4 permits and the IDDE programs tell you to look at outfalls of 36 inches and greater. We're looking at all diameters. And so nutrient testing should be conducted on at least 10% of the floating <coughs> outfalls in the field. So you're talking about wet weather testing then? Sorry? So 10% flowing outfalls, I mean, theoretically, if it's dry weather, there shouldn't be any <coughs> outfalls flowing. So this is wet weather testing then? No, this is dry weather. You're doing IDDE um, testing is done in dry weather. But you would be surprised at how many outfalls are flowing during dry weather. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a piped stream, but sometimes it's an illicit discharge. OK. so. For example, we have about uh, 230 outfalls in the city of Altoona. Mm -hmm. I need to find 23 of them that are flowing. To do nutrient testing on okay. yeah. And um, if there aren't? Yeah, to be clear, if you had 230 outfalls and yeah. 50 were flowing, then you'd have to be 10% of the 50. Of the 50. Which would be carry two drops of water. So we're just looking at the ones that are flowing, testing 10% of those. And also, we're not restricting ourselves, obviously, to city infrastructures. So we would also be testing, you know, private pipes at this level. Yeah, and that's what you were getting at. It actually turns out the smaller pipes are usually hotter than the bigger pipes. Yeah. And the flowing outfalls, usually that's groundwater, you know, because they might be drained in an of 50 acres. And so, right. because the uh, pipes aren't completely water tight, when you have a high water table, the groundwater gets in there. So basically, you're testing to see which ones have sewage and which ones don't. Yeah, because actually, our the way we've read our permit is we have right now probably four or five priorities. So out of those two and three, we found four or five that flow. They come from low areas. We test them, I mean, loudly. 
usually once a year because they're a high priority thing. So I guess that would cover that, that would be a qualification that wouldn't be qualifying. Is there are correct protocols on that? Yeah, I think so. And the other thing I would caution you, I don't want to steal Cecilia's thunder, but um, there aren't a lot of, you know, if you call somebody up at the state who, who the IDD expert is in any state, and mm -hmm. I'm not picking on Pennsylvania, there really aren't that many people that at the state level who know it. So basically, you do your best, try to follow the spirit and intent of what mm -hmm. the city laid out, apply for the program credit, and uh, in your MS work, in your report, and <coughs> anyone in GEP declining you uh, unless you really were fudging the math. Okay. All right. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, so here's that flowchart method that I was mentioning, and the, the idea behind this is when you're testing for something, um, ammonia is a good place to start because there really shouldn't be any ammonia in the stream if there isn't an illicit discharge. It, it's, not a nat it's not naturally found. So it's kind of this, do you have it? Yes. Is it greater than the, whatever the threshold is? Um, this is the recommended threshold. You might say something different. Do you not have it? Well, then maybe you'll test for fluoride. If there isn't any fluoride, then you probably have groundwater or something like that. If there is fluoride, it's most likely drinking water. Um, if there is ammonia, then you're, you know, you're looking for other things like um, you might test for the potassium. And if you've got the right ratio from of ammonia to potassium, um, you know, it could be wastewater, a different ratio. You can see that maybe it's just a laundry discharge. And so this was, this is a modified version of the flowchart method that was outlined in the IDBE manual. Um, it was actually 2005, but this one was modified for Baltimore City based on what their specific needs are. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's just to show us an example. The fourth qualifying criteria in order to get this advanced program credit is to specifically identify the methods and techniques you used to track the illicit discharge back to its source. So some examples of that, okay, visual inspection and outfall screening, I think everyone's doing that. So that one's like when you'll document, and those ORI forms is a way to document that. Um, you know, you might use the flow chart method, you might use smoke testing, dye testing, optical brighteners, I'll talk to you a little bit about that in, the, in a bit. CCTV, we talked a little bit earlier about using that with under drains. Um, sewage sniffing dogs, <laughs> that's one way to do it. Um, and so on and so forth. So there's a number of methods you're gonna find some are more cost effective or better for your community than others, but they just need to be documented as part of this credit. Um, number five, you have to report the number of illicit discharges that you found and eliminated. Here's an example of some people using CCTV, I think, with um, going up the storm drain pipe. Then, in addition, there are some additional qualifying criteria. You have to do at least two of these activities to get the credit. Um, so you have to either do a GIS assessment of your storm and sanitary sewer network to identify high-risk segments for cross-contamination or exfiltration. And again, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so, you know, an example community in Durham, North Carolina that has done that. They did a great job. Um, it sounds like <coughs> people might be doing mapping of their storm drain system right now anyway, so this would be a good opportunity if you have uh, the resources to take a look at this now. Um, here's an example of potential exfiltrate contamination as a result of exfiltration. The sanitary sewer line is supposed to be below the storm drain. We hear time and time again, oh, it's always a low storm drain. But it isn't always, unfortunately. And if there's a crack in the pipe or something, you can end up getting <coughs> sewage, which migrates into the storm drain pipe. So that's just, so by prioritizing your areas, using GIS, if you have it all mapped on GIS, you can kind of say, here's where they cross. Here's where the two lines cross, so we're going to focus our efforts there. Um, example. So again, City of Durham, North Carolina has done this. Um, this is G this is their GIS system, and let me see if I can find the um, the legend. But basically, it looks like we have all the yellow dots are where they're crossing. We've got red dots are sewer 
over storm, and green dots are storm over sewer. Um, and so that's, they've again, they've mapped their sanitary lines, they've mapped their storm drain lines, and they're looking for where their potential, potential, you know, wherever they cross, because that's a potential cross-contamination. In addition, another qualifying criteria, one of those optional ones, you can have to do two of these. Um, you can do, choose to do dry weather stream monitoring as another way to prioritize the segments where you're going to do your work. So it would be the areas that have the highest nutrients or bacteria levels. And you would say, okay, these areas are the areas that we want to really focus our time and attention. Um, again, I mean, you had to do this earlier, so I think it's kind of redundant, but it's the idea that any kind of CCTV inspections, dye testing, or the other methods that were in that table that are being used to find illicit discharge. So it's an example of smoke testing, um, where they put it into a certain household, or they do it in a storm drain, they look where it comes, you know, what house it comes out of. Um, there's the CCTV camera. And then finally, targeted inspection and outreach to business and or industrial facilities that are subject to high risk for illicit discharges or sewer cutting. So restaurants, car rental agencies, anything like that. Um, if you can document that you've done this outreach and inspected some of these facilities, again, that's another one you can choose as part of the advanced credit. Oh. Um, again, you want to do detailed field assessments of the sewer networks to identify, again, we're, this is all trying to get to that prioritization. We realize that, you know, or the panel realizes that you all have limited resources to spend on this, but you still should get credit. I mean, if you're doing a really good job with your IDE program and finding a lot of these pollutant sources and fixing them, why shouldn't you get credit for them? So detailed field assessments of sewer networks to identify segments of high-risk nutrient discharge as a result of exfiltration, just like we talked about with the GIS, and then it's crossing over or dry weather overflows. So question we get, so that's it. Those were the criteria, and we have it in the report. There's a table that goes through. Here's what a basic program generally is. Here's what the advanced program is, and you can see what the differences are. And it's all the ones that I just outlined for you um, in one nice table. So that'll be in our fact sheet. Um, but a question that we get quite a bit is, so, oh, I'm already doing an IDE program as part of my MS4 permit. Can I just get credit for that? And the answer is no, you don't, because you have to take it that step further. You have to do nutrient testing. You have to do it on 10% of the flowing outfalls. You have to use, you have to document how you use these other techniques to track it up the pipe. So I'm going to take you through a design <laughs> example for the programmatic credit. And... Um, what we're going to see, it's going to be a surprise, but what we're going to see is it's not a huge credit. But again, once you're already doing all these different techniques to find and fix the illicit discharges, in two years when the individual discharge credit gets ready, you are in a perfect position to get that credit, and that's where you're going to get a real <coughs> credit. Um, so in this example, um, well, first let me just say this map is of Sligo Creek in Montgomery County, Maryland. And all these red dots, so they walk the street. They basically start at the bottom and walk up looking for every outfall of every size. Every single one of those red markers is an outfall that came up hot for ammonia at that threshold. Wow. So that's how many illicit discharge, potential illicit discharge. Are they all sewage? Maybe not. I don't know. But so that's that was quite a bit. And so there's this the, that's kind of what the panel found when they were reviewing the information is that this is a huge potential source to our urban nutrient load. So, in our design example, our Bay Village decides they're going to move to this nutrient-based advanced programmatic approach. And they're going to target their efforts in two priority catchments. Um, and maybe those, priori maybe those catchments are prioritized because of high nutrient levels or high bacteria levels or something else. Icky Creek and Filthy Rock. So together, the two catchments are 3,600 acres in size, and they're about 64% pervious. So we're going to need those numbers when we go through that calculation. Um, they document in their annual MS4 report that they met the programmatic requirements and modified their existing program. So how they compute it. I'm going to do this first step for you, just so we can all be on the same page but you don't really have to do it because the state does it for you, okay? 
So you need to determine, so in our example, which, which you wouldn't have to do, which is determine the unit area nutrient load from pervious land and then multiply by 0 0.20. We talked about that earlier as the 0.2%. So the staff determined that the unit area nitrogen and phosphorus loads are 10.43 and 0.43 pounds per acre per year, respectively, within, again, within their jurisdiction. Is multiplied by the dry weather baseline multiplier of 0.2 to get us this new number of 2.09 and 0.086. Okay, so again, we're doing this just for the example. You don't have to, the state will do it for you. So you'll be given those numbers. So these unit loads are being are multiplied by the qualifying acres of pervious land. So those those two watersheds, those two catchments we were focusing our efforts in, Icky Creek and Filthy Run. We said with 3,600 acres times 64 percent, so we've got 2,300 acres of pervious land in those catchments. So that's multiplied by that number there, right? So that gives us our potential. <coughs> now we're going to multiply them by 0 0.01 to determine what the actual reduction in credit will be. So we get a whopping 48 pounds per year of nitrogen and 2 pounds per year of phosphorus. So it's not a huge number, but that, again, as I said, is not the objective. The objective was, okay, now everyone's used to using CCTV. Everyone's used to mapping our storm drain and our sanitary systems. We are used to looking at outfalls less than 36 inches. We're used to doing nutrient testing as opposed to just visual inspection. And so in a year and a half, I think, we'll get the individual discharge credit. There are some very specific reporting, tracking, and verification requirements as a result of getting this advanced program credit. Um, something that Tom talked about earlier is that the limit, you know, the life span of the credit. So the acres that you did the advanced program in, that credit will last for five years and then it will expire. You can do it, um, you can get the credit in additional acres if you do additional areas. So we did Icky Creek and Filthy Run. If we do this other watershed over here, we can get the credit there. Ultimate goal is to shift to reporting for individual nutrient discharges. In 20, this is 2018, it's 2017. 20, January 1st, 2018. January 1st, 2018. Really important, if you do the programmatic credit in this catchment and then you get the individual credit, you can't take both at the same time because that would be double counting. And they don't like double counting. Um, so that's the reporting track and verification for the advanced program credit. credit. Um, why does this matter? Um, there are more than a thousand communities in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. This is the watershed boundary there, which is Pennsylvania, right there in the middle. Um, that um, more than a thousand communities <laughs> that already have a requirement to have an IDDE program because they have an MS4 permit. So with a few changes, this IDDE program can be an advanced IDDE program. Um, thousands of dry weather overflows occur anyway in the Bay, so, but there really isn't a local incentive to reduce the problem. And then one thing we have found, at least in Maryland and some communities in Virginia, and maybe this is the case in Pennsylvania, um, is that it's an opportunity to enlist new partners so we see a lot of watershed groups doing the actual outfall screening and walking the streams and collecting. You can train them very easily to investigate an outfall. You can even do the nutrient sampling. Maybe they can't use, you know, maybe you're not going to give them the CCTV to go up back up the line, but they can do a lot of the field work um, to get started. It also is an op excellent education and uh, uh, <coughs> opportunity, which is another requirement under your MS4 permit. So, I'm going to change that to 2018. Um, the other aspect of the panel, the other credit that will be available, January 1, 2018, is a credit for individual discharges. And that, we're going to talk, I'm just going to tell you about that right now. What this, what, the way this works is, if you can, do, you can get credit for these, for finding an individual discharge, if you can detect it and eliminate it, you can do on-site sampling of the discharge that's about to be eliminated, and you have to define one or more of the following parameters, the nutrient concentration, the average daily flow, or the duration, the flow duration. 
and then you have to do a couple um, inspections or monitoring to verify that the discharge was actually eliminated. Now, for the discharges outlined in the report, these are these vary. You know, is it the nutrient concentration you have to collect? What are the inspection requirements? They're variable. But basically, the way you calculate your credit with these is you tested the concentration of that discharge. You've estimated the average daily flow. There's a conversion factor, which is in the report, and maybe either you know the duration or you've estimated the duration. Again, it depends on the individual discharge. And then you get the annual load, and that's the credit you get. So it's a much higher credit than that um, programmatic credit we were just talking about. So one thing the panel did was identify what different types of discharges are commonly found in the watershed that are going to be found um, through this IDD program. And they outlined them as, and so again, as I said, you know, based on what discharge in the report, there's a profile sheet for each discharge. It kind of describes it, shows maybe what the inspection requirements are, what the verification requirements are, um, whether or not there's any kind of default numbers associated with it, um, <coughs> and so on and so forth. So there were eight discharges that they identified. Laundry, wash water, actually I like this slide better. Laundry wash water, commercial car washing, shop floor drains, miscellaneous high nutrient discharges. So I think you can get a lot of dis different discharges in this miscellaneous category. Um, direct sanitary sewer discharges, drinking water transmission loss, sewer pipe exfiltration, and then potentially big one, dry weather sanitary sewer. That said, not all discharges will be, uh, will qualify for this credit. So one thing the panel did was differentiate between kind of what they assumed to be like long-term ongoing discharges versus emergency discharges. So this is a picture from Baltimore City uh, where you have a water main break and the street collapses. Immediately people are dispatched to the scene to fix it because the street is Collapsed. So that discharge is not an ongoing, long-term thing, so the panel decided it shouldn't get credit towards TMDLs. So it's not contributing over the long term, so it shouldn't reduce it. So emergency discharges are not going to be available for the, for the credit. It's going to be more about you're targeting an area with your advanced program and your advanced techniques, and because of all this sleuthing, maybe you partnered with a watershed group or somebody else, because of all the sleuthing, you found all these high nutrient pollution sources. So before I go on, does anybody have any questions? Does any of that make sense? <clears throat> it's going to be a test. No, there's not. Okay, <laughs> just kidding. Okay, so how do we find these illicit discharges in the field? So we worked with our friends at the Center for Watershed Protection who have done quite a bit of this work. And like I said, we brought uh, a webcast, which is on our website. I highly encourage going to do it. But one thing we've all realized doing this work is you don't, nobody has the time or resources to constantly be walking in the street, even though I'd much rather be walking in the stream all day. I couldn't tell my boss that, though. <laughs> um, and investigating outfalls. So you're like, okay, what, how are we going to focus the search. Let's take our resources and figure out where we really want to focus our time and efforts. So what they, they essentially term this is illicit discharge potential. Which, which areas have the highest potential for illicit discharges to occur? We've already talked about where sanitary and storm drain cross each other. That's a really high potential area. Um, and then you prioritize your field work in that area. So here's an um, if you have GIS, I highly recommend GIS as a way to do like in the office, you know, cutting down versus looking at the whole area, but just focusing. But if you don't have GIS, I don't think that means it's impossible. I think you can put waders on and just walk up the stream. Um, this shows you in green, those are all the MS4 outfalls. So they're not going to spend, you know, that's a, that would be a huge amount of time to go and investigate every outfall and test it for nutrients as well. 
So they're going to try to prioritize where they want to spend their time. The one thing that a locality should do is choose screening factors that are important to you. So different characteristics that can be mapped that would relate to the level of risk for illicit discharges. So some examples would be, we already talked about prioritizing sub-watersheds based on poor water quality, so high nutrient or high bacteria levels. Um, areas of older development tend to have a lot of illicit discharges because infrastructure is either broken or cracked or accidentally or on purpose tied into the storm drain system. Industrial areas, we talked about that as a potential source of illicit discharges. And then high density of storm stormwater outfall areas, or of course, any areas with a history. I will just say, I think, Donna, you're going to make all these PowerPoints available to everyone yes, after the workshop. So we're going to have a, a page on our website for these workshops that Allison and Drew are going to set up when we get back to the office. And all the PowerPoints, anything to download that we presented today including the agendas will be available. Senders? Mm -hmm. And the agendas for the future things. So really want you to look at those too. Well, when we close up, I'll go into my spiel. Oh. What time did you tell me to remind you? 1.30? Or 1.15? 1.30. Great. Right. Okay, we're good. It's 1.16. Okay. <laughs> um, so our, again, our friends in the city of Durham, North Carolina, they have a really aggressive program and they do monthly monitoring, stream monitoring, I know, for nutrients. Um, because they have a very strict TMDL down there and major water quality issues. Um, so you don't have to do that, but this is an example of how they do uh, pathogen monitoring monthly in order to prioritize those catchments that they're going to focus their efforts in. So they're not going to do everything all the time. They're going to focus their efforts in the hot, the ones that have high hits. So those are the blobs shown in, that are dark with the arrows. And then you can see a couple other blobs that are, that they've also called out. And even some more. <laughs> so step two, um, you're, you wanna divide up your jurisdiction into smaller wa sub-watersheds or sewer sheds um, and characterize them. So again, we're, we're relying heavily on GIS in this approach, but um, that's again, just to focus our resources. So we want to use GIS to <coughs> characterize each of our sub-areas um, as a result of their screening factors. So in our last example, we said outfall density was a potential screening factor we would use to look at a different area. So here's an example of a GIS function you could do to find that area just using GIS. So talk about a spatial join and dissolve. Is anybody in this, who has GIS? You have a lot of layers, some layers, yeah. So you can do, you know, either, you, I don't know if you do it yourself or you have someone in the office who works with the GIS, there are techniques and methods using GIS to, again, just focus that before you're even dispatching anyone to the field. So here is an example of what it looks like. Um, here's the watershed. It's been prioritized. Um, We've got all these different layers, the older development, the watershed boundaries, the streams. They're not all showing, but using those screening factors, they've come up with a prioritization scheme of high, medium, and low. And so you can see, okay, these subcatchments in red are the high risk areas. So we're gonna target our efforts there first. And then we've got a medium, I'm sorry, everything in yellow is medium, so that might be, be like our second priority. And then the areas we think are in pretty good shape, but if we have extra time on our hands, we'll go there too. So that just showed you the characterization. Um, and again, this is the ranking and scoring in order to prioritize. So in this particular example, they said, okay, we're using outfall density to look at where, what areas we should look at. Um, so areas with six outfalls or less only get a point, and they fall into that low risk category. Outfall or areas that have seven to nine outfalls get two points, so they'll be medium. And ten outfalls or more will be in the high risk. And again, you can do that all so it's like coded in and it just tells you where to go. I think I just showed you that. Okay, so we've decided that we're going to prioritize our efforts in order to find these illicit discharges. 
Now, how are we going to find these illicit discharges? Um, a lot of this is taken from the IDDE manual, which is free for download. If you haven't seen it. Um, but I think things, a lot of things have changed since 2005. I think a lot of uh, developments in technology in the field. So people have been able to find discharges a little bit better. So some common methods that are used, visual inspection and outfall screening. We've just talked about that, using those forms. Um, sample and test flow for indicators. We're going to get into that in a little more detail because nutrient testing is a big part of this. You have to go a step beyond visual inspection. Some other ones, sewer overflow reporting and um, public hotlines. A lot of times people call them in from the community. There are other methods out there, like optical brighteners, which I'll touch on a little bit. Um, the sewage sniffing dog we've already talked about. And again, isotopic tracing. But some of this stuff can be very expensive. Yes? Just one thing. Um, we are working with the county uh, conservation district on the web page update for stormwater for all the municipalities. And we're going to have an IDD form on that page so that the public can just go in there and fill it out, shoot it to the conservation district, and then I'll shoot it out to you if there's a violation reported to each municipality. Just makes it easier. They know where to go for it. They don't have to mail it in. And it will generate a spreadsheet that you guys can use in reporting as well. So That's great. We did it for Cumberland as well. Oh, good. And we're going to be doing it for others in the future. So when you get out in the field, some of the information you want to have on those field maps, and so we were just talking about having GIS and you have all these layers, but um, some of the required data layers are the roads, the streams, the watershed boundaries, obviously the locations of outfall, do you have that information? It sounds like you need to document that anyway. Manhole locations, those come really, really come in handy as you're tracing it back up the pipe. Um, sewer infrastructure we talked about and jurisdictional boundaries. Some additional data layers that will really come in handy if you have them. Aerial photography, um, where the water main line is, because again, you can get credit for a water main discharge. Um, land cover, topography, things like that. But they're a little bit more optional. There's an example, again, I think this is also, I think this is also Sligo Creek. Looks like it. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, New Hampshire Avenue. So this is the one I showed you before with all the red markers, but this is just, this is before they went out in the field. So this is the major field map. It basically shows you this is the yellow boundary, the area we're going to, that's draining. But this is the area we're going to investigate. So we're going to walk up the stream that way. Then when you, but you obviously need something at a smaller scale when you're actually in the field walking up the stream. So it's kind of a location map. And then this gives you a lot more detailed information. If you put all those layers on that big map, you wouldn't be able to see anything. It would be too crowded. So we were looking at now we have <coughs> sanitary and storm drain and manholes, water lines, and all sorts of good stuff. So dry weather outfall screening, I think this gets to a question I was asked earlier. You want to do it at least 48 hours after a precipitation event because you don't you're not trying to test rainwater. So we have better things to do with our time. Um, you, it's better during a period of low groundwater, which is, tends to be the fall, which you don't have in snow melt. So some time of year considerations for being out in the field. Um, winter can be a little challenging. You have frozen flows. It definitely happened to me. I was trying to get a, I was trying to get a sample, <laughs> something that looked like that. It was, it didn't work too well. I needed like a hair dryer. Uh, safety, <laughs> road salt. We talked about that a little bit. And temperature actually will impact. I mean, my, my digital camera kept shutting down every time I tried to take a picture because it was too cold out. Um, spring can be a little challenging because of the high groundwater table as a result of the snow melt. And then summer can be a little challenging because of excess vegetation. Um, and so it's challenging to find the actual outfall. <coughs> so personally, we recommend fall as a good time of year to do these stream walks. Um, the vegetation has died back a little bit. It's not too cold. And typically, road salt and groundwater influences our at minimum. So when we're looking at the visual approach, this visual inspection of the outfalls, what are we looking for? Number one, is there flow, right? That's a big one. Um, any odor, any color, there really shouldn't be any color or odor associated with the water. Transparency, and then anyone who's familiar with IDD programs, this is a lovely term that came out of the industry. 
floatables. When there tends to be a sewage uh, discharge, you if you don't know immediately by nutrient testing, there's some some anecdotal evidence maybe, <laughs> like toilet paper, there tends to be stuff like that. So that's a lovely term, floatable. Some other stuff you're looking for from a visual perspective, um, you're looking for outfall damage, some of the stuff Tom was talking about earlier, deposits and stains that might indicate that there, maybe there's an intermittent discharge and it's just not happening while you're there, abnormal vegetation, poor pool quality. This was the one I showed at the beginning and it's actually the cover of our final report, I think. Um, sewage discharges tend to be really gray. I mean, you can smell them too, and there are the floatables, but they're just like this gray, cloudy water. It's almost like gross. Um, and pipe by benthic So, illicit discharge problem outfall. So, you've got a flowing outfall. Um, is it illicit or not? Is it groundwater flow? Is it a pipe stream? It's not necessarily apparent from the physical indicators alone. And then, as we've just discussed, as part of the credit, you need to have nutrients. So you have to test parameters um, in the flow to determine if it's an illicit discharge. <clears throat> so here are some commonly used parameters. I kind of already went over them with the, or touched on them with the flow chart, but I'll go into them in a little bit more detail. Ammonia, like I said, really the only source should be sewage or laundry water, wash water. Detergents or surfactants, depends on what term you want to use, that's usually from laundry wash water. It shouldn't be naturally found in the watershed. Optical brighteners, this is also found in wash water. Potassium tends to be found in sewage or industrial waste. Fluoride is a very good indicator of tap water. Um, conductivity is an indicator of industrial waste or wash water, and bacteria can be an indicator of sewage. So some different sampling approaches. There is um, single parameter screening, which is we're going to look at one of those parameters and determine, make, you know, make a determination of what to do. Um, use the flow chart method, which I'll go over, or industrial flow benchmarks. So single parameter screening. This is when you use something like detergents or ammonia that you wouldn't otherwise find in the watershed and say, okay, this means we have an illicit discharge. And then we'll go from there. So the the detergents is the best single parameter to detect a <laughs> discharge because they really shouldn't be there otherwise. Um, the thing with detergents is they're, um, you can find them best in a lab setting, so it's not as quick. You know, you really want to have a parameter that you're testing for while you're in the field because then you can react immediately. But if you're taking samples back to the lab, this is a good one to look for. Ammonia, again, you really shouldn't have any ammonia, but it's that threshold that you need to exceed in order for it to trigger um, an investigation. You can analyze for ammonia using um, field techniques. We've got a, using a portable spectro, spectrophotometer, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. So again, I think just went over this. This is the, this was the flow chart that was in the IDDE manuals. This is the basic one, the one that was ultimately adapted and I showed you later on. So you would use the this flowchart approach, but you would adapt it um, for thresholds based on your water quality. So again, this one looks at four parameters. We're looking at, do we have surfactants? Yes or no? No, is there fluoride greater than 0.25 milligrams per liter? Yes, it's probably tap or irrigation water. No, it's probably groundwater. Do we have surfactants? Yes. Okay, let's look at the ammonia to potassium ratio. If it's greater than one, it's potentially wastewater. If it's not, it's possibly wash water. So it's the basic flowchart method, but we recommend that you adapt it based on your community. I showed you this already. This is the one that was adapted for Baltimore. The industrial benchmarks that um, was the other thing that I mentioned. And this is, you're either looking for the same, you're looking at the same parameter, but at a different concentration than we just talked about, or maybe you're looking at a, a different parameter that we hadn't talked about, and that would indicate industrial activity. So conductivity, <coughs> hardness, pH, turbidity. And then obviously thresholds for potassium and ammonia are a little bit different. 
So some simple low cost equipment for testing for these different parameters. There are um, comparative color metric methods. That's where you put it in the sample and then you look at the different colors in the rainbow and say, which one does it match? It's like when you test, you have a pool. You've ever done that with a pool? Um, simple probes, pH conductivity, ion selective potassium probes, they can be done very rapidly. And then there are these spectrophotometric methods that can be done either in the field or in the lab. Um, but as this little note says, it's much safer and much more reliable results will come in the lab. Here's um, some examples of those color, color metrics. Um, so these are different ones where you can see how you could test for the detergents and how how you do that. It's 1.30. Okay, thank you. I'm on track. <laughs> um, optical brighteners, I mentioned this a couple times. So sometimes you'll have an illicit discharge that is intermittent. So it might not be discharging from the outfall when you're in the field. So you don't actually see it, but maybe you see, um, I mean, sanitary doesn't typically happen in an intermittent way. Um, but maybe you'll see like some toilet paper or something that would make you think. Or maybe you will have tested the stream and you have very high nutrient or bacteria levels and you can't figure out why. You haven't been able to find a source. So what these are is they're like a little sponge, like gauze, and you put them in the, you kind of anchor them to the outfall in the pipe. And you leave for a couple days. And then you come back and you, you might not see anything, but then you put them under a black light. And if there are, if there is an illicit discharge, you will see stuff as a result under that black line. So it can be very helpful in like a very problem metric. You know, there's a problem case. So they're called optical brightener traps. And I think I just said that, two to three days, then you dry and look at it under the black light. So here's, here's here they are hanging up in like, that's what they look like in the dark. Um, you know, they're hanging up and it's dark and then you look at them with the black light. So here are some examples of those probes or meters that I was talking about that can be used in the field for either conductivity, pH, or temperature, or potassium. That would be used quite a bit when I was walking some streams. Here are those spectro spectrophotometers that I was talking about. Um, this one is for testing fluoride. Um, I think this one has to be used in the lab. Um, this one test, this is a really good field one for testing ammonia. And again, that ammonia is a really good single parameter indicator. Um, some considerations with this is when you mix the solutions together, you can't dump it in the stream because that would be an illicit discharge. So you gotta carry all your waste with you. So if you're walking the stream, that stuff adds up real fast. And you know, carrying that kind of liquid gets real heavy. Um, bacteria testing, there's a couple different techniques. And again, that's really, watershed dependent if bacteria is an issue. The bay, we look at nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, but again, this is this should be based on your local needs. So this is the most probable number method. Um, it's really expensive. <laughs> that was my big takeaway with that. It's not that, I don't know how accurate it is, but it's really expensive. And then there's a plate, you know, using your traditional plating the bacteria and cooking it for 24 hours and counting <laughs> how many colonies you have. Um, I think I just started to touch on this, but um, it's really important. You have to kind of consider both the field versus the lab analysis. Field is great because you immediately know if you have a hot outfall, and then maybe you can call in another team to track it back upstream as the other people continue to go. Um, there's the waste disposal consideration that I just mentioned. You have to carry it so it can be really heavy. The lab is obviously better because it's got controlled conditions. Um, it's gonna be more accurate less likely to make mistakes, you have a lot of materials there. Um, but again, you don't want to like always be lugging everything back to the lab. Our friends in Durham have a lot of different information they, or uh, technology that they take out in the field when they do um, their IDPE work. They have their tablet um, with that has all the GIS on it, which is kind of neat, because then they can see, all right, we've got a hot one and now we can try to follow, follow the line versus trying to like find where the sanitary line goes as a result of manholes. Um, they've got their test kits and their tracing dumps. So those first three that are bolded, those are like, they need those to do anything. 
Everything else, I think, is when, when it's available, they take it with them. And look, they have a machete, too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'd let a public employee have a machete. Well, it's part of their <laughs> stuff. Uh, we're, uh, yeah, here in Appalachia, we're plenty allowed to have machetes. <laughs> And yeah. some, and some. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we prioritize our catchments. We've, we, we know what we're testing for. We found dis illicit discharges. How do we find where they're coming from? So it's coming out of the alcohol, but where is it starting? We've talked a little bit about smoke testing, dye testing, and sewage sniffing dogs. But this can be a tricky part of illicit discharge detection and elimination, is finding the actual source. So again, cracking it up the storm drain network, doing drainage area investigations, video surveys and dye testing tend to be our primary methods. Um, some other methods, smoke testing, the dogs, flow meet, sewer pipe flow metering to make sure that what's going in is what's coming out. And if it's not, it's being lost somewhere along the way. Um, other sewer, sewer assets. So to track it up the storm drain network, again, during dry weather only, um, you're gonna basically isolate it at man, um, isolate the flow at different manholes. So you're starting at the outfall and you're going upstream. First thing to look for are physical indicators, as we've talked about, and then you can also sample in the manholes and test for the chemical indicators that we've discussed already. You're gonna have to use a few different techniques because you're no longer standing in an outfall with it coming out, but you've gotta maybe lower this down to get your sample, you know, maybe eight or 10 feet. So here's a good schematic. So you start at the outfall, so here's the outfall in the stream, and the discharge observed at the outfall, and you're gonna work up the pipe network. So your first manhole and your second manhole are checked, um, and there's an illicit discharge that's present. You go to the third one, and there's no flow and no obvious indicators. So we kind of know that somewhere between here and here, we've got the illicit discharge that's begun. Does that make sense? Okay. So isolate the flow between the two manholes. That's the goal. Here's an example um, of that. So we've got our, our map, and here's what we've got. This is our screen. We've, or here's our stream, we've got outfall one and two, and outfall three, and it's just exactly what we did. We had to track it back up the pipe network <clears throat> to isolate it. Um, again, I've touched on this quite a bit, I think it's a really important point, is mapping where those sanitary and storm water lines cross. Um, if you listen to the webcast, you'll hear them say how they were the ones in Durham that said, their sanitary folks said, or their wastewater folks said, oh, our pipes are always beneath the stormwater pipes. And they were like, well, we found, I don't know how many we found, 50,000 uh, sanitary that are actually above the storm. Wow. So those are all potential discharge sources. Um, and then I guess you can see here, 16% of the crossings were ended up being locations that be high risk for IV. <clears throat> So one of the things that you always surprised me, the expert panel looked at how leaky sewer pipes were. And they're designed for like 400 gallons per 100 feet of loss. It was, it sounds worse than it is because it tends to be a buildup, they call it a collimation layer or something, where the sewage kind of layers up the bacteria. But uh, it's People think they're a lot more watertight than they actually are. Uh, and this isn't about them breaking or whatever. It's the kind of, you know, mankind's not really invented a watertight transmission pipe for either. It's even worse for drinking water because that's under pressure. And there's a lot of studies that show that as much as 20% is lost from the reservoir to the tap. Oh, wow. Interesting. And most of the sanitary sewer lines tend to be in the stream valley because it's the low point. Well, as an example of that, at Blue Plains, which is a big regional sewer treatment plant in Washington, D.C., they invested in a, uh, <coughs> we call them line pipes, so 
Uh, uh, pipeline? <laughs> An II program where they basically seal up the inside of the pipe. Oh, yeah. Put the sleeves in there and yeah. sponge. They were able to get uh, or save uh, 40 million gallons per day system wide. Um, so that kind of tells you the flip side of how much uh, sewage was actually spreading out and they made the pipes a little bit better. I think they're designed for 300 MGP, so they mm -hmm. They have a lot of older pipes. So it's an older city. Sorry for the digression. It's fine. <laughs> it's a good and we still have, in the city of Altena, we still have brick stairs. In the city of Baltimore, we still have wooden pipes. Yeah. Oh, wooden? Yeah. Not as many as we used to. Yep. Now you can replace the brick. I'm <laughs> sorry. It's not a bad thing. Could help it. Um, so again, Dur some slides from Durham, um, maps of where the sanitary and the um, sewer locations cross, um, but having the maps of the infrastructure and the land cover land use is really important. So obviously they have a really robust GIS program. Um, all the green here, hopefully you can see it, is um, different junctions and manholes. And so that, again, is really focused their efforts to make a fee in that difference. Um, drainage area investigation. So this is another technique for finding the source of the discharge. Um, driving or walking around and looking at potential discharge source sites. Um, it's kind of... Um, yeah, it only works if the flow is distinct. It's not going to really work if it's an intermittent flow. Um, having routine but random patrols, see if it's maybe a weekend business that's generating the source, <coughs> um, but not everyone's looking for illicit discharges on the weekends. Um, and again, it's not helpful for finding underground sewage leaks. Um, using video surveillance to find the source of the illicit discharges using the CCTVs to go up the pipe. Um, you can use it on either the sanitary sewer system and look for um, cracks or um, connections or the storm drain section. Um, so yeah, you can see the live image can show you cracks, leaks, breaks, and blockages. But this is a better, this is better for continuous discharges. Dye testing where you actually put dye into the storm drain system and See where it comes out, or you put it into this. You know, maybe you've isolated between these two manholes, and then you'll put it in all of these ten houses that hook into the sanitary sewer system. You'll put it down the toilet, and then see where it comes out. Um, you do have to let the public know that you're going to do this, otherwise, you're going to get a lot of calls or people saying, "But the stream is pink, or the stream is green, or something." So, maybe yeah. <laughs> St. Patrick's Day discharge. Um, Confirm that the sewage is actually getting into the sanitary sewer system. This is one of my favorite slides. This is, again, Durham. And using the CCTV, they couldn't find the source of this discharge. They, could, they'd, I, they knew it was there. They're trying to isolate it. They can't find where it's coming from. Well, this, upon further investigation, it turns that the sanitary sewer line completely eroded away on the bottom, so this is just rock. <laughs> it's getting right into the wow. So they're like, the pipe is there. It seems to be going. And there was no more. I have a lot of resources available for you all because I thought that this is kind of a crazy topic. Um, I told you about the two dish, uh, webcasts we did earlier this year. I linked to them here. So if you get a copy of the PowerPoint, you can simply click on the link and take you straight there. That said, you can also, if you really want this information before that, you can take a look at our website. Um, that's the final panel report in all its glory. Um, that's the IDDE manual, if any of you haven't seen that. Also available on our website, but I'll, I'll send it to Donna to include on that website too. Um, technical appendices to that report are really important because that's got like the ORI form and a lot of other information. Um, I recommend using the City of Durham's webpage. They have a lot of um, very easy to revise templates that you could then make your own. Um, and they're very open with all their information, so anyone can have it. And then we have an illicit discharge prevention page in our College of Stormwater Knowledge. <laughs> and that's all I have. Does Thank anybody have?
Any questions or comments? No. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, a lot of this can be applied to different types of areas. But I'm just curious how much experience or field time you have in the Me personally? Yeah. I think I have only walked, I have only done illicit discharge detection in highly urban areas. But I will defer to you because you have a lot more experience. Yeah, I'd say um, it's, it's a great question of, of each of these tools. You kind of have to look at your community and say which one is most appropriate. Uh, and based on a lot of what she's shown, this is discharges cluster, if you will, in the more urban areas. Uh, but there have been uh, in rural areas there are still illicit discharges but they tend to come more from failing septic systems. And so when you get there, you're outside of the sewer envelope completely in most cases, and if you're relying on uh, that. Uh, and so if I'm in a rural area, I think I would concentrate more on adapting those methods to find failing septic systems or clusters of septic systems, and then uh, there are credits available uh, that the wastewater work group has done for septic system upgrades uh, and septic system pump outs and whatnot. So rural areas may want to look at those. Great question. So, uh, tech. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So, you work directly with municipalities and I work with a rural municipality, yeah. um, not myself, but there are uh, uh, communities uh, that have developed fairly effective programs to manage uh, and inspect the quality of the separate systems. Uh, but you're right, it's, you, if you're an MS4, maybe sometimes there's it can be crazy shapes, but you could have an MS4 with a storm drain system, but not a sewer system. And so I, I've never worked with anyone in that category. So you said there's lots of examples of communities out there. Do you have one? Yeah, we, we could get back to you and give you some examples. Um, there was just that um, study that we did for pressure checking for us on separate systems. Yeah. Uh, clean out, so we can get you some of that literature. It's not as abundant as some other practices, but... Um, and and uh, another thing to keep in mind is it might not be the practice that you use. You know, when he was talking at the beginning of the day of the suite of practices, the, that one might not be the one that is where you want to put all your time and effort, because it's not as applicable to your individual community. Okay, thank you. Um, so technically, we're scheduled for a break. Do you want to take a break now? Or do you want to talk about retrofits and then take a break? Or how do you want to do it? What do you guys think? It's a small enough group. Do you want to take a break now? Do you want to 